In this video, we want to talk about some of the details of how memory works for the programs that we run, and in particular, how it's laid out. Your programs basically have two areas of memory. So when a program runs, we get a chunk of memory. So your program gets to use that block of memory right there. Okay? And the two ends of this are typically separated. One end is what is called the stack. And one end is what is called the heap. Now, in Scala, you're not really exposed to where these are. Turns out that in a C program or a C++ program, you can do a little playing around. And at least on the programs that I've worked with, you have a large area of memory and the heap is actually at the low addresses and the stack is at the high addresses. Every time you call a function, it gets a little, what is referred to as a stack frame. So we get little chunks of memory. So your main might get that chunk of memory. And when main calls something else, it will get that chunk of memory. And if that function calls something else, it'll get that chunk of memory. When this function returns, it gives back that memory. And then when this function returns, it gives back that memory. And then it grows and it shrinks and it goes, grows and it shrinks. In the previous video, we saw an example of a runtime error where my program crashed because my recursion didn't terminate. I had an infinite recursion. Well, what happened there was my main method called, my main function called another function, which because it was an infinite recursion, it called itself and called itself and called itself and called itself, etc., 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 and it wound up filling up all the memory that was allocated for the stack. On the other hand here, we have something called the heap. And kind of as the name implies, the heap is not nearly as organized as the stack. When you allocate objects, you get some space on the heap. You don't necessarily know where it is, and we get a reference to it. Now, I've previously shown that one way to think, for example, in Scala, about the declaration val s equals pi is to imagine that you have a box. This box happens to be named, actually I don't want the name on the inside. This box is named S and S references another box over here and this box does have the value high stored in it. And the reference looks something like that. Yeah. Turns out that this is going to exist on the stack. So the function that has this declaration in it, the reference here, the S, is going to be part of the stack frame. It's going to be one of these little elements in the stack. There's a number of things that get stored on the stack, including the local variables, the local references. The objects that you get hold of are allocated on the heap. And so they can actually live across multiple function calls. So it would be possible this function declares s, does some stuff with it, and then at the very end, it gives back the value s. And so we could have had this was inside of a, a function that returns a string. Well, because the object high is over here in the heap, remember when that function returns, it goes away. So the S reference, this part over here, goes away, but we're going to give back the reference to this object so that the code that's one layer up can know where this object is. When nothing is ever using it anymore, the garbage collector will come around and get rid of it. So Things that you put on the heap don't go away until nothing's using them. Things that are on the stack are taken away as soon as a function returns. So 
as a brief introduction to the layout of the memory in your program, the stack side and the, the heap side, when we talk about recursion uh, in a bit, we'll actually go into more detail about why this matters. We'll see how the structure of the stack is helpful for more complex recursive functions.